Well, welcome back for another episode of the Chamber Podcast. My name is Rob Johnson. We have another great show for you today. Joining me in studio is Laurel Zoot. She is the co-owner of Wild Birds Unlimited of Brighton. Laurel, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me. So I am incredibly interested. You are the first of this business classification to be on this podcast in over 125 episodes, I think. I'm your first bird nerd. First bird nerd. <laughs> I love it. So so if you and I meet at a networking event and you're like, oh, I work at or I own Wild Birds Unlimited, what's that elevator pitch that you give back to me when I say, oh, what is that? Okay. So we are a small uh, brick and mortar retail space that supports the hobby of backyard bird feeding. Um, we are part of a franchise. Um, there's more than 360 of us peppered around the U.S. and Canada, but each location is independently owned and operated. So my husband and I own the Brighton, Michigan Wild Birds Unlimited. And our motto is we bring people and nature together and we do it with excellence. I love it. <laughs> So at what point were you like, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to merge people and birds. We're going to get this hobbyist. Uh, I imagine it's people that just want to watch birds in their backyard. So walk me through the decision-making process of, all right, this is what we're going to do. So, um, well, first off, if, uh, you know, there's 96 million Americans ages 16 and older, uh, that either feed the birds, watch the birds, or photograph birds. Um, so that's about a third of U.S. adults are tied into birds one way or another. Um, and uh, my husband and I um, were just rather entrepreneurial-minded. Uh, I have worked as a naturalist and an educator for about 18 years now. Um, I have a degree in parks management. I've worked for the Metro Parks, the DNR, um, different park districts and nature centers. And uh, one day I was kind of lamenting to my husband um, just uh, the frustration of uh, government bureaucracy in the park district I was working for. And his response was, do you know what your problem is? Which every spouse really wants to hear their loved ones say. It's like, yeah. no, really, tell me what my problem is. No, this is a conversation where you're not supposed to be talking. Right. I'm just supposed to be talking to you and you're listening. <laughs> That's right. I don't need you to fix it. <laughs> but he's like, you know what your problem is? You just need people to get out of your way so you can do your job. And um, he was absolutely right. Uh, so I did start a business called uh, Nature on the Go uh, a little over a decade ago. And I worked from home. I traveled all over the state of Michigan to libraries, day camps, senior living facilities, scout troop meetings, teaching about Michigan wildlife and ecology. And after about three or four years of doing that, I'd outgrown the house. And we were kind of debating, do I rent a brick and mortar space um, to house nature on the go? Uh, what do we do in the off season when people aren't hiring programs and guest speakers? How do you pay the rent? Um, do you supplement your income by selling things like binoculars and bird feeders and butterfly nets? And, uh, like a wild birds unlimited, I had actually taught programs at the Royal Oak location. Um, and so unbeknownst to me, my husband popped online, researched wild birds unlimited and discovered our area was, uh, recognized potential franchise location. And we went through the research and vetting process and that's how we got the ball rolling. So it's kind of a dual purpose. So do you still do the Nature on the Go programs throughout um, the summer? So Nature on the Go is more or less merged with Wild Birds Unlimited Brighton. Okay. So uh, uh, my focus has kind of gone away from all Michigan wildlife. Uh, uh, you know, I used to do programs on white-tailed deer in Michigan, coyotes in Michigan. I would travel. I had a pet skunk. I would do like the Secret Lives of Skunks programs. Um and so it's really transitioned into bird focused, uh, Michigan birds, bird conservation, species specific. Um, and so I do, instead of traveling the whole state, I really focus on our store's territory, which is Livingston County. So like last week, I was at the Brighton Library teaching about bird migration. Um, Thursday, I hosted a program in our store all about the Finch family. Um, so it's really kind of been consolidated and gone a route of more 
specific bird things. I love yeah. it. I need to know about this pet skunk because that was that, <laughs> I almost cut you off when you when you said that. I, I say I, what again? <laughs> I have to know how this came about. So. Uh, When I had Nature on the Go, my focus was Michigan wildlife, Um, and I wrote a business plan, and it was definitely that all programs I offered would focus on Michigan ecology, Michigan wildlife, Um, because cable TV, like Animal Planet, National Geo, you know, all these great Discovery Channel, they're great but we, I see a phenomenon where people know more about like the penguins in Antarctica than they know about, you know, the coyotes here in Michigan, like local wildlife. There's a disconnect. Sure. So part of my business model was Michigan wildlife only. And if I acquired an animal for educational purposes, I would call it an animal ambassador. Um, I had my wildlife and captivity permit from the Michigan DNR because you can't just go out and capture animals and make them a quote unquote pet. Uh, it's regulated. So I had my permits. And um, when I was looking for a mammal animal ambassador, um, one of the fascinating ones to look at would be getting a skunk. Um, so descented, uh, had to come from a breeder in Michigan. There are people who have pet skunks. Um, Florida hosts like the National Pet Skunk Show every year. (laughs) Um, And so that's when I was researching my different options. What could I house? What would be manageable? What could I take on the road for teaching? Um, A skunk was a good fit. So I, yeah, had skunks in my lives for about 12 years. (laughs) Just a question out of ignorance. Uh, Can you, how do you not get sprayed? Uh, in Michigan, um, the law is if you procure a skunk from a licensed breeder, the breeder has to have the scent glands removed prior to sale. I see. So they're not fully loaded. <laughs> Understood. So they're uh, shooting blanks, so to yeah, speak. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. All right. So so the business has been around since late 2016, right? So well, we got keys to our space in October 2016 so that we could convert a old shoe store into our Wild Birds Unlimited. And then we opened our doors, took about five months to do the build out and, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, so we opened our doors March 1st, 2017. Okay. Yeah. So when people come to the store, what give me a visual. What would they, what would they see? What do, what do most customers do and how do they interact when they come in? Uh, So when they come in, uh, we do have our loyal, faithful customers. They come in either weekly, monthly to get their bird feeding supplies, stock up on seed and and food. Um, When we have new people come in, uh, we get a couple different reactions. Uh, One is a look of bewilderment and confusion. Um, I thought you had live birds in here, you know, kind of question mark. Um, And that happens quasi-regularly with new people. They just uh, see the name Wild Birds Unlimited, and they think, you know, birds in cages. There's an unlimited amount of wild birds in this store. (laughs) Right, right. So we usually have to do the little caveat of where do the wild animals live? Wild animals live outside. We support the wild birds outside your window. Um, If you want birds in cages, you know, you're going to be looking for, like, a pet store. Um, And... Then we have people who come in and uh, the reaction after we've been there seven and a half years is like, oh, are you new? When did you open? I had no idea you were here. And that's because, you know, our sales floor is about a thousand square feet. Um, And so our storefront compared to other stores in the mall is pretty tiny. We we just kind of people drive by or walk past and they don't notice um, us. Um, But when they come in, they're going to be greeted by one or two store cats. Uh, We have two store cats, Martin and Finch, Um, and uh, displays of bird baths, uh, bird feeders, bird food, uh, anything to support the hobby, bird houses. Um, We do tend to rotate things seasonally. So in the spring, you know, we're highlighting Baltimore Orioles and Oriole feeders, hummingbird feeders, bird houses. Uh, Going into fall, we're going to start highlighting um, our goldfinch um, because it's breeding season. They're a late season nester Um, and uh, highlighting like caching season because September, October is caching season for like our chickadees and blue jays and nuthatches and such. Okay. With the store, uh, what, 
I guess from a regular perspective, like when, when people are coming in, is it largely just so sourcing food and then, you know, any new displays that you have, is that, is that largely what regulars are coming in for? Uh, yeah. So your regulars, um, because b- bird food is a consumable, your birds in the backyard are consuming it. You will have regular customers who are just coming in for refills. Um, but also where, you know, backyard bird feeding is a hobby. And so people who are engaged in a hobby want to talk about their hobby. Yeah. So we'll have people come in with uh, pictures on their cell phone. Let me show you what I saw at my tree, in my yard, at my bird feeder, in my bird bath. And um, uh, sometimes they'll just want to share like a unique bird behavior they've seen, a unique bird. I've never had this bird before. Uh, So in addition to getting what they need to supply their bird feeders and um, take care of their hobby, uh, they're also getting that community, that community of bird nerds of, yes, show me what you saw in your yard. Uh, What's this new bird that you saw at your feeder? Um, All of our staff, we're all engaged in the hobby and we want to hear about your hobby. I have a, uh, I follow an Instagram page and it's all wildlife photography and usually it's done from, you know, several hundred you know meters away because usually it's in Africa or something like that, but they've been focusing a lot more on birds lately. And when you said 96 million Americans are, you know, in some way, shape or form engaged in that, you mentioned photography like this, it just makes so much sense to have a business around this mm-hmm. because there's so many people who are actively engaged. For you, two questions. Number one, uh, what is the most rare bird that you've seen, and do you have a favorite bird? Um, So rare bird that I've seen, uh, Michigan's really unique in the fact that uh, over 90% of a bird called Kirtland's warblers nest here. Um, They require very specific size, height, jack pine trees for their nesting cycle. So if the jack pine trees are left to grow um, uh, continuously, eventually uh, they'll grow to a point that the Kirtland warbler won't use it anymore. Um, And uh, I went last summer on a Michigan Audubon tour to see the nesting breeding habitat of the Kirtland's warbler, and it was was really cool. Uh, Favorite bird? Um, It depends on the day. It depends on the season. Um, So I like a better question is, what is your spark bird? And a spark bird is uh, basically the first bird you see as an individual that sparks your interest in what the heck is that? I got to learn about that bird. And now I need to learn more about other birds. Um, And so for me, my spark bird is a cedar waxwing. So hiking out in a nature preserve in Oakland County about 20 years ago, uh, knew my basics of birds and birding, but when I saw a flock of cedar wax wings and they kind of have like a little bandit mask and uh, unique coloring and they look very exotic, I'm like, what the heck is that? I had (laughs) no idea something so cool existed in Michigan. Tell me more. Um, Yeah. That's interesting. So that's spark bird? Spark bird. And see, that's almost every bird for me because I don't know, like, I question what a cardinal looks like sometimes. That's probably (laughs) the most recognizable bird. Depends on the season. Like right now is molting season and uh, cardinals are kind of known. So molting is the process of dropping all your individual feathers and growing brand new feathers to be in tip top shape either for fall migration or hanging out for our Michigan winter weather. And cardinals have this habit of blowing all their head feathers at once. So you might not recognize a cardinal. We get a lot of questions. Is this a new bird species? And it's a (laughs) bald-headed cardinal because it's a black, bare-naked head on a red-feathered body. They look like a mini vulture or something. It's kind of ridiculous. (laughs) Well, now I feel feel somewhat better. So it depends on the season. And is it a male? Is it a female? Is it a juvenile? Juveniles look different than the parents. Um, There's a lot more to it than just knowing, hey... I know that individual bird. This is a question just for me, not the listeners. I'm genuinely curious. How long does an average bird live? Uh, really depends on the species. Um, okay. So uh, something like um, morning doves, you know, which are very common. They're prolific breeders. They can do like five to six nest cycles a year. Um, you know, they might only live uh, one, two, three years, um, pretty short-lived. 
But then you can have something tiny like a hummingbird. Um, there was a documented female hummingbird coming back to the same yard, same tree to build her nest for seven consecutive years. So you think of like something so much smaller than a dove living two to three times longer. Um, and then, of course, you know, your larger birds like eagles and owls, you know, we're into decades. So it really depends on the species. Yeah, it's interesting about the hummingbirds is all the cardio they're doing. You'd think they'd wear out yeah. quicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. So tell me about what the next year of the business looks like for you guys from a planning perspective. What are you hoping to do from a you know, speaking engagements or education mm -hmm. standpoint? Just kind of walk me through the next six to 12 months for the company. So for us, we are actually about to go into our slow season, uh, September, October, um, people, uh, depending on the growing season, and we haven't had a drought so much this year, um, they don't need to refill their feeders as often. So with your bird feeders, we're really supplementing natural forage. Um, uh, studies show that birds who have access to bird feeders maybe garner about 20% of their groceries or calories from your bird feeder, and the rest is natural forage. So when we've had a good growing season, your wildflowers are going to seed, uh, berries are coming in, tree nuts like acorns and hickories are coming in. There's a lot of natural food for our birds. So in slow season, uh, we uh, try to focus on... Um, hosting in-store programs, going out into the community to teach. Uh, September, I'll be teaching at like the Heartland uh, Autobahn and Nature Club, um, teaching at the Fowlerville Library. Again, I try to travel anywhere in Livingston County. If there's a group who's curious, um, I'm happy to go do a program. Um, but we're also, because it's retail, and this is very weird for me, I'm a nature nerd who happens to own a retail space. Uh, <laughs> So it's very hard to think um, <clears throat> Christmas um, <laughs> when we're sitting here in August and it's 90 degrees out. Sure. But, uh, you know, the next couple of months, we will be flipping our store um, with uh, Christmas inventory. Um, we do our trade show with Wild Birds Unlimited is in June. We've already placed those orders. That inventory will come in and then we'll flip for the holidays. Okay. Uh, November tends to land on like customer appreciation um, and uh, programs will start to wane a bit because it is our busy season. And I think that's true for a lot of mom and pop retail shops is, you know, Christmas is what will carry you through the slow times. So um We'll navigate the holidays and then we'll start fresh January, February nice. and the year with end of year inventory, all these fun things that you have to do as a retail <laughs> owner, even though all you want to do is talk about birds and look at birds all the time. Um, there's logistics at play to be a responsible business owner that will take <laughs> care of the next few months. Do you find that the longer you do it, the more you love what you do and the more you love, you know, watching birds and you know being a part of that environment. I find um the uh better we are staffed, the more I love what I do. <laughs> um so the first couple years my husband and I, I mean it's like uh, when you open up a brand new business, it's like drinking from a fire hose of information. Sure. Um I've heard it called baptism by fire. Like you're just kind of chucked to the wolves like learn how to write purchase orders and reconcile inventory and manage your margins and all of that. Um, and my husband worked IT. He was an IT director for 20 years who happened to have the hobby of backyard bird feeding. Um, so you've got a nature nerd and an IT guy that are like, let's open a retail space. Um, so there's a huge learning curve. Um, and trying to train staff and get people with some, you know, longevity was hard. Um, and then we were getting our legs under us when the pandemic happened. Um, and we lost about all our staff and had to start at square one again. Um, today we have a flock of five incredible employees and because they can manage the things that I don't want to do, um, I don't want to be chained to the desk doing, uh, inventory and purchase orders and writing the staff schedule. Our manager is great at it and she actually enjoys it. So that affords me the time to create new programs, get out to the community more, do more teaching, because that is my passion. My passion is educating. Um, so the better our staff and the longer our staff stays, the more I love what I do. I love it. 
I love it. So tell me uh, if someone wants to know more about Wild Birds Unlimited of Brighton, where where should they go? Uh, so we do have a website, uh, wbu.com backslash Brighton. We'll take you to our unique uh, franchise location. You can also fa- uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, again, WBU or Wild Birds Unlimited Brighton. Um, and if you go to our website, you can find the links to those social media things. Um And you can also, if you have questions about the store um, or questions about birds or things like that, feel free to drop us an email, uh, wbubrighton at gmail.com. We're always happy to educate or answer questions or troubleshoot um, what you're seeing in your yard. Love it. Well, Laurel, thank you so much. I certainly appreciate your time. Mm, My pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting me. Very good. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap up this week's edition of the Chamber Podcast. All of Laurel's information can be found in the show notes. So if you missed all of that, just check the description for this episode. Apart from that, we'll catch you next week with another show. Take care.